what what we know about FMT, and I can also speak about my personal experience with FMT, is uh, that it has incredibly high cure rate for C. difficile, Clostridium difficile. And that is miraculous. It's better than any drug uh, out there. And and of course, you know, it's it's been used typically for refractory or recurrent C. diff infections. And it's kind of a shame that um, it's it's not used earlier in C. diff because these these people in the U.S. who have to wait to get FMT are taking round after round of antibiotics in order to qualify to get a fecal transplant. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out, including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. In this week's episode of the Radical Health Rebel podcast, entitled Invisible Extinction of the Human Microbiome, I interviewed film producer Stephen Lawrence about his documentary movie called The Invisible Extinction. In this episode, Stephen shares his story as to why he became interested in the human microbiome, and we discussed whether the overuse of antibiotics was responsible for many of today's modern diseases. We discussed bacteria and food allergies, antibiotic use and celiac disease, Fecal microbiome transplants or FMTs, microbiome swabbing of babies born via C-section, autism and the microbiome, and current research being performed using FMTs. For me, this is a really fascinating subject, and I think you'll find this episode fascinating too. Stephen Lawrence, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Lee. Delighted to be here. So, Stephen, to kick things off, could you explain your journey from being hired by Manhattan Cable TV in 1972 up to the point where you said, I know, I'm going to make a movie about feces and I'm going to call it The Invisible Extinction. <laughs> well, it, it's not, ex- The Invisible Extinction is not exactly a film about poop or, or <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a long journey you're talking about, uh, 50 years, a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I started out, uh, in the early days of what was then a video revolution when Mm -hmm. the first portable video equipment became available. And that really changed uh, the way media was made because for the first time, um, anyone who could purchase a a porta pack could make their own TV. Mm. I imagine they were pretty big back in those days. They, they were big and heavy. They probably weighed. 25 or 30 pounds. Um, but as a young person, I, I didn't notice the weight. Uh, mm. it, it was pretty exciting. So, uh, you know, that initial uh, media experience for me uh, was, uh, it was about uh, democratizing media. That's what really drew me to it. Uh, the possibility that with public access, which was a a federally mandated policy in the United States for cable TV systems, anyone could make a video and put it on um, a a cable TV uh, system and tell their story. And so that drew people from all phases of life, many of them activists. Uh, So for the first time, you had programming available on television um, that was um, you know, pushing the boundaries in terms of uh, anti-war sentiment at that time. There was the Vietnam War, yeah. uh, gay rights, uh, rights for uh, mentally ill people. Um, it, it, you know, it was just a, an incredible spectrum of activism and artistic creativity that found its way onto television. And I just compare it to the YouTube uh, it was yep. in many ways the yep. YouTube of its day, and um, from there, I I segued more into documentary filmmaking, 
and and I also had kind of a sub uh, specialty in music. Um, I I grew up playing music and loving music, and I started to uh, document uh, the uh, the punk and new wave music scene mm-hmm. in New York City in the 1970s. And all that eventually led me to be one of the first people hired by MTV Music Television, which was another media revolution uh, mm. that launched in, I forget what year, probably 1980 or 81. Mm. Um, so I was one of the original people there. I was producing and directing documentaries about musicians. And so you 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 wouldn't think that <laughs> that kind of work would lead me eventually to making a film about the microbiome. But part of my work for MTV, one of the last things I did for them was a documentary about, uh, well, then it was called the Soviet Union, Russia. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make a film about the underground Soviet rock scene, which was the Mm -hmm. antithesis of the American music scene, which had become Mm -hmm. highly highly corporatized, uh, driven by hits, driven by radio and MTV. So I wanted to make a film about people in a place where that kind of individual expression through music was actually controlled by the state. And Mm -hmm. there was a risk to, uh, to be an outspoken uh, rock musician in the Soviet union at that time. So I made a film called tell Tchaikovsky, the news rock in Russia. And that began um, uh, an immersion over several years for me in Russia uh, and the former Soviet Union. And during my years working there, I picked up parasitic infections, uh, which can happen. If you, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're more vulnerable to parasites. I think if you haven't grown up in a particular um, microbial environment, let's say, mm-hmm. and your body mm-hmm. is accustomed to them. Anyway, I started to get sick. I started to lose weight. Um you know, have fatigue and and weight loss were the the primary symptoms. And my health fell apart in in the early 1990s. And I didn't know what was happening. Um, The the initial diagnosis was that I had uh, a couple of parasitic infections, Giardia and Mm -hmm. uh, Amoeba E. histolytica. And uh, sorry, I keep hitting my key key pad. <laughs> uh, so we're getting some sound effects there. Anyway, uh, the, the standard treatment for those kinds of infections are antibiotics. And mm. I, I think I've probably had a few courses of antibiotics previously, but for uh, the symptoms I was having, there were repeated doses over several years because the infection appeared to be refractory, meaning simply that the symptoms kept returning. And in those days, nobody knew about the microbiome and there, uh, you know, some doctors would talk about gut flora as, mm-hmm. as a thing, but they didn't really know what it meant. And the idea of killing off an infection was far more important than the idea of protecting whatever that gut flora was. Mm. So over a decade and a little more, I was given round after round of antibiotics treating symptoms of uh, what was essentially very bad IBS and Mm -hmm. food intolerances. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think I had parasites anymore. Mm -hmm. I think they were long gone. Mm -hmm. But because the symptoms were similar, the assumption was that I had a refractory infection and keep bombing me with antibiotics. Um, Eventually, I rebelled and just said, no, no more. But along the way, I developed several health problems, uh, which, again, eventually led me to this film. I, in addition to IBS and, and significant weight loss, um, I developed autoimmune thyroid disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, several food intolerances to gluten, to lactose. Um, eventually, I uh, developed a kind of mast cell activation syndrome, um, where, you know, foods high in histamine were problematic for me. I developed early osteoporosis. I had environmental allergies that I'd never had before. 
So there was an avalanche of symptoms and health problems that followed uh, what was medically unnecessary use of antibiotics. Yeah. I was naive. The doctors were ignorant. But eventually I said no more antibiotics. I started to do research and uh, I came to the conclusion that my immune system had been damaged somehow by by all of the antibiotics. Um, either that or I, I had some kind of underlying um, immunodeficiency, but that, that couldn't be proven one way or the other when it began, whether it was acquired or innate. So, uh, you know, I was in a very dark place for uh, several years, um, just struggling to get my energy and health back together to start to gain some weight, to start to expand my diet again. I was on a very restricted diet. What what seemed to help me in those years was um, what's called the specific carbohydrate diet, which is similar mm-hmm. to the paleo diet. And I'm I'm sure you're familiar with with all yeah. these different diets for people yeah. with digestive problems. Mm. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, during that time, I I was still uh, making films. Um, uh, different kinds of documentaries, some music documentaries. I, I did a series of collaborations uh, with Michael Apted, who's now deceased, who's who's famous in the UK for the Seven Up films. Um, uh, so uh, you know, I managed to keep going professionally, and uh, you know, I hadn't thought initially about making a science documentary because that wasn't part of my uh, experience. But I had this personal history, and I felt it was time to do a wake up call for for mm-hmm. the general public about this problem. As as the as research about the microbiome began to emerge in the two thousands in the twenty first century, you know, I was more and more interested in the subject. But I had not been planning to make a film specifically about this, and then by chance in two thousand fourteen. Um, I got invited to a dinner where I met Sarah Shank, my collaborator on this film, and she told me that she had uh, been doing some preliminary work on a documentary she wanted to make about the microbiome. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what brought her to the mm. to uh, that decision. Uh, and um, she had met Marty Blazer and Gloria Dominguez Bayo, who are the scientists. Mm-hmm key scientific protagonists in The Invisible Extinction. And um, she was looking for a collaborator. She uh, had not made a feature documentary before, and uh, it it is not easy to get a film like this made in the U.S. where there isn't, you know, there there really isn't any government support for documentaries. And you're, you're kind of on your own trying to get financing from channels and studios or uh, foundations or uh, individuals. So anyway, we decided to team up and move forward. And eventually we got enough money uh, from donors uh, to mm-hmm. start what became the, invis- the Invisible Extinction. So that's a, a kind of a, a capsule history of what brought me from being mm. a, a young man uh, starting off in the media world to making the invisible extinction. Great, I love I love that story, and I just want to share very quickly my story. Uh, m- most of my audience would have known some of what I'm about to say, but I've never mentioned the whole thing. So I I was born with a condition called pyloric stenosis, which is basically a blockage between the stomach and the small intestine. So I had to have life-saving surgery at six weeks old. So that was my first experience of antibiotics. Uh, I was bottle-fed as a baby. And at two years old, I was hospitalized with gastrointestinal um, uh, gastroenteritis, which was my second introduction to antibiotics. At the age of seven or eight, I think I was seven, I had tonsillitis and I was given penicillin. And uh, I'd had I'd actually had tonsillitis for ten days, and I kept saying to my mum, "I don't feel I really don't feel good. I really don't feel good." 
And she kept going, no, son, you're going to school. You're going to school. And I was like, oh, I'm really tired. I really don't feel well. I've got a sore throat. I don't feel well. And eventually I kept on and kept on. And my mum thought, oh, maybe maybe he's not not well. So anyway, he took me to the doctor and the doctor looked down my throat and, she, and he straight away said, he's got tonsillitis. I'll give you some antibiotics. So he gave me penicillin. And by this time, I was actually starting to feel better already, even before I took the, the antibiotics. So I got home and I took the antibiotic and I went out on my bike and I started riding down the road and I was probably about 600 meters from my home. And I looked down and my skin, had, I looked at my skin and it had turned a red color. It looked like blancmange. And I thought, that doesn't look right. And I looked down at my legs and my legs were the same color. And I thought, oh, I better go home. So I went home and I walked in and my parents went, what's happened to you? turns out I'm allergic to penicillin. So they had to rush me back to the doctor's office. And then at the age of 13, I started getting acne, as a lot of kids do, right? But I then went on an 18-year journey of almost constant antibiotics. And one of the reasons why, because people say, well, why didn't you stop? When you've got acne and and it's really bad, you naturally think if I stop taking antibiotics, it's just going to get even worse, right? But I went to see, I mean, again, I'm cutting a very long story short, but I went to see a Chinese doctor. And the first thing he said to me, you've got to stop taking these antibiotics. And I changed my diet, my lifestyle, and voila, my skin got better. But I just wanted to share with you, that was kind of like my my story of antibiotics. And you can you can almost see the chronology of, you know, one form of antibiotics potentially may have caused the next problem and so on and so on. Yeah. There is a a bit of a similar background with me. Um, I I was born prematurely, not too much, two to three weeks. Mm. And um, I was also bottle fed, which was typical in, in those days in the States. Um, nobody understood at that point the the virtues of mm. breast milk. It was mm. another innovation, just like antibiotics. Although right. antibiotics have have saved probably hundreds of millions of mm. lives over yeah. many years, S- saved mine when I was six weeks old. Yeah, uh, there you go. Um, I I took antibiotics a few times for acne when I was a teenager, but I didn't. You know, I didn't take a lot. So I I don't think I ever had antibiotics before I was maybe 15. Mm. And, and, you know, sometimes I think to myself, gosh, if, if I had been exposed to antibiotics the way the the typical young person is now in Mm. the U S it's, um, you know, three doses by the age of three, 10 doses by the age of 10, 20 by the age of, of 20. If I had been, inundated with antibiotics to that extent, and then in my 30s had uh, been hit again with round after round, uh, you know, the the damage would have been so extreme, I don't know if I could have recovered. Like you, I also did uh, start to work with a Chinese herbalist. This was around 2000, who uh, was fantastic. Mine was 2000 as well. Oh, well, there you go. There we go. (laughs) And uh, and I have continued to uh, work with the same herbalist over many years who has been just incredibly supportive. Uh, uh, You know, my my treatment for osteoporosis has been entirely herbal and has been Mm. pretty successful uh, Mm. to the dismay of every endocrinologist I've ever uh, consulted with who just, Mm. you know, they just scratch their head and say, well, there's no clinical evidence that that should work. So I have nothing Mm. to say, you know, Mm. if you want to go ahead and fracture your, your hip or your back, that's up to you. Mm. Yeah. So what I'd like to do if possible is maybe in a roughly in a chronological order, kind of take you through the movie. And if you can explain some certain bits of the movie, and I'm going to ask you some specific questions. And if you can explain kind of some of the things that people can expect uh, to, to to see and to hear about if they watch your movie. Okay. So, so in the in the movie, Doctor Blazer uh, suggests that you know the reason for a lot of 
modern diseases, particularly ob- obesity and diabetes, is likely due to the to the use of antibiotics in early life. Could you explain some of the specific information that Dr. Blazer shared on antibiotic use and its links with obesity and diabetes? Uh, yes, both Dr. Blazer, who I will call Marty because mm-hmm. that's, that's how I know him yep. and yep. become a friend, and uh, and his wife, uh, Gloria dominguez Bayo. Mm-hmm. they're both very focused on the problem of unnecessary use of antibiotics in early life. In your case, it was necessary to save your life. Uh, in the case of, of uh, one of the subjects in our film, uh, Ning Ning, the Chinese boy, he was born mm-hmm. with pneumonia. And yes, antibiotic use was absolutely necessary. Um, but their concern, which is based on research, is that uh, using antibiotics early interferes with the proper development of immunity of of a child's immune system and um uh, of course for c-section babies uh, who don't catch up microbi- microbially in terms of diversity until the second year uh, mm-hmm. when you compare them with vaginally born babies um, that's uh, another area of vulnerability. So the science is continuing to develop, to evolve, and emerge on this subject. But the studies, uh, which uh, there have been large studies done in the United States and Denmark and in other countries, that are uh, look at a large cohort of Hmm. people over many years from childhood into teens and adulthood, they show an extremely high correlation between antibiotic use and certain diseases. Hmm. Um, Whether you consider obesity a disease or not, that's that's the question that uh, is out there. But um, being overweight, having metabolic syndrome is not generally considered a healthy thing. So Hmm. obesity... Diabetes, um, severe food allergies, asthma, um, those are are the primary areas where uh, there there has been study. But there are are several diseases which are touched on in the film, which are correlated with um, this period, the last 50 years. 60, 70 years in which antibiotics have been increasingly used. And those uh, those include digestive diseases like IBS, inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, uh, thyroiditis. Um, there is some correlation with, with autism, although that's kind of a, a controversial subject, and we can talk about mm. that later. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, there's a tremendous amount of research, I'm sure you probably know, going on t- into the relationship mm. uh, between uh, the, the gut microbiome and depression. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's being studied for, uh, uh, you know, as, as an adjunct treatment, FMT is an adjunct treatment in certain cancers uh, where immunotherapy is being used, um, Parkinson's, MS. You know, it's not as if any and every disease <laughs> is connected to the microbiome. But I think the fact that all this research is happening right now, uh, it tells you that there's tremendous excitement and energy in the scientific community Mm. about discovering the relationship of our gut microbes to various aspects of our health. Mm. And, uh, you know, our film, The Invisible Extinction, is about the early days of this scientific revolution. And Mm -hmm. I think it's really good as a a kind of primer for people who have heard about the microbiome and they don't know really what it is and how their gut microbes relate to their health. Um, And and as I said earlier, you know, my intention with it and and Sarah's was to uh, put out there a wake-up call that would mm. connect with the general public. Because 
our microbiome, even though it's it's inside us, it's part of this larger problem of biodiversity, of our biodiversity mm. on the planet being challenged. Yeah. Yeah. And most people know about the climate crisis, and most people, or, or many people, understand that a lot of species on the planet are going extinct, but they mm. don't know about this internal extinction that has started to happen. And that's why we yeah. called the film The Invisible Extinction, simply because most people don't know about it. Yeah, and I, I'm certainly seeing, you know, lab testing clients, I certainly see some people with, I mean, again, you don't know whether it's a genetic thing or whether they're supposed to have them, but I see a lot of people where, you know, we, we measure the amount of certain microbes in, in, in someone's colon. And for some people, you know, it should be, let's say, two. It's zero. There's literally none in their gut. You know, I, I have that as a couple of bacteria that we kind of think they should be there. You know, they're, they're considered beneficial bacteria, but I don't have any. But then when you look at my history, it's, it's not really that surprising that I might have a few bacteria that are no longer there. And and even testing over the years and even, you know, doing a lot of work and using probiotics and prebiotics, they're still not there. And it's like, okay, maybe for me, they are extinct. And I've just got to do the best I can with what I've got. You know? I uh, Yes, that, that is a question that the film raises also, mm. which is restoration. Is restoration mm. possible? That's kind of the holy grail, uh, particularly mm. for people like you and me who have lost diversity. And then you have the, you know, the bigger and scarier question of diversity being lost or diminished from one generation to the next because the mother mm. who has lost um, a lot of diversity through antibiotic use, maybe exposure to chemicals, uh, you know, diet can be a factor. She can't pass on to her kids what she doesn't have. So how are they um, going to be microbially, microbially um, diverse enough and resilient enough uh, to, to be healthy, to be normal? So yeah. we, you know, it's, it's not just a crisis for people who are living now. It's a it's a crisis for future generations, and yeah. and that's one reason why the the microbiota vault, which is part of the mm -hmm. film too, one of Gloria's yeah. uh, projects that Mar Marty is also working on. That's why it's so critical to protect and preserve the ancestral human microbiome before it completely mm -hmm. vanishes. Yeah, yeah, and what's interesting as well is that. You know, again, there's lots of studies showing depending on what you eat directly affects the makeup of your microbiome. And again, in, in the movie, you talk about, you know, native hunter gatherers microbiomes compared to people that live in, in the Western world. Well, just to uh, just to uh, throw out one more point, which mm. is made in the film, what what Marty and Gloria say, and I think this is accepted by the scientific community, is that in the developed world, we have generally lost 50% of our microbial diversity. Mm. And as Marty says, that that has consequences. Mm. Yeah, and, and, look at, and look at the amount of chronic degenerative disease yeah. we have in the Western world now. Yes. It's, it's, you know, we're in a worse state than we've ever been. Yes. And, and, that, and that brings me, I guess, to Another point is that whilst we're talking about the microbiome of our own bodies, particularly you know our, our gut, what's also crucial, and again that's why I was starting to talk about nutrition, was that we also need to consider the microbiome of the soil that our foods are grown in. And the more and more chemicals we're putting on the soil, again, the more damage we're going to ultimately do to our gut microbiome. And, and sadly, the people that seem to be in charge of the climate crisis seem to be coming up with solutions that are going to cause even more damage to the soil rather than regenerating the soil using regenerative farming techniques. They seem to want more chemicals on the soil, more, you know, uh, gene altering techniques rather than, you know, let nature do its job that it's been doing for many millions of years 
supporting us, you know. When 35-year-old Amanda first scheduled to see me, she'd been suffering for 19 years from severe IBS, diarrhea and faecal incontinence, along with abdominal pain and bloating. Her condition had not only made life uncomfortable for Amanda, but very inconvenient as she had to walk two hours to work every day along a route that had public toilets, and she'd never been on holiday as an adult because of her condition. The only advice that several doctors and specialists had given Amanda was to take Imodium, and when she first saw me, she was taking five Imodium a day and wasn't getting any better. To help Amanda, I ran tests to find out what foods were right for her metabolic type, to see which foods she was sensitive to, and to assess her gut microbiome. Tests showed that Amanda had several food sensitivities and a parasite infection. Over the coming weeks, I coached Amanda to eat right of her type and to replace the foods she was sensitive to and a protocol to deal with her parasite infection. And after three months, Amanda was IBS free and she also reported her skin was much improved and she had lost weight. And she booked a holiday for her and her husband to New York as they'd never been on a proper honeymoon because of her IBS. And if you're suffering like Amanda was and you want to get to the root cause of your problem, you can arrange a consultation with me at www.bodycheck.co.uk. And if we're a good fit, I could help you achieve the same kind of results as Amanda. Now, back to the podcast. We don't, we don't get into uh, the question of chemical pollution of, of soil and the environment generally in the film. It's touched on as, mm-hmm. as a factor. Um, but that isn't a focus and I I would encourage your listeners and and followers to uh, do research in this area because it is an emerging field of research and really, really important. You know, there are, there are multiple factors in Mm. uh, the loss of microbial diversity, Uh, uh, diet, uh, you know, a, a, a poor diet, is one of them, you know, processed foods, stripping foods mm-hmm. of their nutrients. But then you're talking about the origins of the food um, and the loss of soil diversity. So yeah. it's, you know, you have to look at this problem holistically. Mm. And in the film, we don't claim to be uh, treating every stress point on on mm. the microbiome. Yeah. But, yeah. but thank you for for bringing that up. Those are important mm. questions. I mean, in the movie, I mean, you do you do mention quite a lot of things that are affecting, you know, the difference between the Western society and native hunter gatherer types. You know, so it's not just antibiotics or processed foods. You know, it is chlorinated water, which you know, let's face it, that means bleached water. What does bleach yeah. do to bacteria? It kills them. And then we've mentioned you know, chemical fertilizers and pesticides on the soil. You know, you do mention all those things in the film. You might not go into a lot of detail, but you do mention them, right? Yes. And and just getting back to the work that Gloria has done over many years um, in in the Amazon basin, working with indigenous uh, villages and uh, indigenous peoples who Mm. um, are collaborating with her, cooperating in her research. you know, her research has shown from collected samples from these these peoples that they have usually twice the diversity we do, that they have mm. uh, gut microbes that we don't have, that you can't find at all uh, mm. in, in the, the guts of people in developed countries. So she is trying to uh, create a vault, kind of a Noah's Ark, of our mm-hmm. ancestral microbiome to uh, preserve these uh, microbes for research purposes. Uh, and this is done in collaboration with the countries where the, the microbes come from. Um, so there, you know, there is no um, unethical exploitation. Everything mm-hmm. is, is done collaboratively at a very uh, ethical level. Um, mm. But anyway, we don't know. We don't know yet because it's it's too early in the research whether some of these mm. microbes that uh, Yanomami peoples or uh, other tribes have, whether they can help cure our diseases. Maybe they can. 
you know, we, we have to see. You talked about the fact that you are missing some strains, bacterial mm-hmm. strains completely. Um, I, you know, from the limited uh, microbiome testing I've done, yeah, it, it's it's the same for me. But, mm. you know, we can only test for certain microbes now. Mm. And yeah. that's a very limited uh, look at the spectrum of, yeah. of the gut microbiome. So uh, scientists like Marty Blazer say, okay, you know, those microbiome tests that are commercially available now, uh, they might be useful for some people just to to show that uh, there's a lack of diversity against what's considered the norm. Mm. But they're just not that scientifically useful now, particularly because you can't restore by using probiotics. And and like mm. you, I have used probiotics over the years. I think they have been helpful at times, mm. but it is kind of hit or miss. Um, and since they don't colonize, mm. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of taking them as like a daily vitamin, let's yeah. say, you know, they're passing yeah. through you and maybe for some people they are helping mm. as they pass through. Uh, but that, you know, uh, th- there's a lot of research that still has to be done. And the, the idea that of, of matching microbes with deficiencies to cure diseases is a very exciting area. And in the invisible extinction, we look at that in one case specifically with food allergies mm. uh, through the work of a, a, a immunologist at Harvard University named Talal Chatila, who's found that one, you know, in, in mice with severe food allergies, there is one microbe one bacterial strain that is is specifically missing and that when you restore that in those mice, their food allergies go away. Yeah, that's subdogranulum, isn't it? Yes, subdoly granulum. So will that work in humans? We don't know. There there are other researchers in, in the US and I, I think in other countries doing parallel research, looking at the relationship between gut microbes and food allergies. So the you know this is this is all to say uh, that there's a lot of excitement. There's some studies in animal models. Uh, there, there's a study at Boston Children's Hospital using FMT uh, for for food allergies uh, mm-hmm. that is showing, um, I, I think, some promise. But sorry, just to just note that FMT is fecal microbiome transplant. Yes, right. So, yeah. but it's 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 hit or miss. Because there is no science yet for matching mm. uh, donor and recipient, and what what we know about FMT, and I can also speak about my personal experience with FMT, is uh, that it has incredibly high cure rate for C. difficile, Clostridium difficile, and mm-hmm. that is miraculous. It's better than any drug uh, mm. out there. And and yeah. of course, you know it's it's been used typically for refractory or recurrent C diff infections, and it's kind of a shame that um, it's it's not used earlier in C diff because these these people in the U.S. who have to wait to get FMT are taking round after round of antibiotics mm. in order to qualify to get a fecal transplant, and it'd be better if they could you know, when they have this nasty C. diff infection, just go ahead, you know, get mm. that, uh, uh, you know, infusion of of healthy microbes. Anyway, mm. that's where we are. Yeah, I guess, I guess big pharma need their cut first before they uh, yeah. let someone, let someone get a cure. Yeah, I mean, their big pharma is, is trying to come up with, um, you know, pharmaceutical equivalents of FMT. Mm. And, yeah. uh, you know, this has been going on for, for five or 10 years now. And I, some of them are in, or, you know, I think are getting close to being able to market. They're in phase two or phase three clinical trials, which is the, uh, you know, the, the format that our Food and Drug Administration mm. FDA uses, you know, to bring yeah. drugs to the marketplace. But, um, yeah. 
yes, uh, of course, big pharma, <laughs> big pharma <laughs> wants to exploit FMT, but not as a <laughs> biological thing that goes from donor to recipient. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, you're talking about probiotics, and I guess from my own view, I kind of see it as a treatment rather than a cure. You know, I definitely think for some people they do have benefit, and there's, you know, there's tons of studies. I mean, I've I've read countless studies showing improvements in people with acne, because obviously that's a subject I'm interested in myself. There's tons of studies showing that how um, probiotic use actually does reduce symptomology of of acne um and you know that's the case with with lots of other things as well but it, it's not a, a cure all issue you know it's not a cure right as you say it doesn't colonize um but they definitely in my experience have benefit so one of the thing one of the things in the movie as well was um dr blazer's daughter and they were talking about the fact that she's got celiac disease which i know you mentioned celiac disease earlier And they believe that that was potentially caused by antibiotic use by her in early life as well, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, Marty's daughter uh, received antibiotics for ear infections uh, Mm. when when she was young. And then many years later, and and you see this in the film, uh, she picked up a Giardia infection. She was in Peru. She ate some raw fish. And what happened to her is in some way similar to what happened to me. She was given multiple rounds of antibiotics um, for the, the, the parasitic infection and subsequently uh, was diagnosed with celiac disease. So she mm. did not eat gluten. Um uh, when she eats gluten, she has bad intestinal symptoms. Uh, you know, what happened to me was a little bit different in that it wasn't full-blown celiac, but gluten intolerance. So in the film, Marty connects her her celiac uh, disease with her early childhood use of antibiotics. Um, he feels that it's likely that that use set her up, um, you know, weakened her um, uh, gut microbiome, disrupted her gut microbiome to the extent that when she was a, a young woman, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure whether she was in her late twenties or early thirties when uh, she, uh, she had the parasite infection, um, but the treatment with the antibiotics tripped her into mm. celiac disease. And right now there is no cure for celiac disease. You just have Mm. to avoid gluten for the rest of your life. And I've I've been doing that for 30 years. Mm. It's it's a lot easier now because there are a lot of Mm. gluten-free products uh, available. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, Clostridium difficile. Could you share the story of Teresa? from the movie yes, and the treatment that she got and, and what the response was from the treatment. Well, I don't want to give away the film too much because I can, <laughs> um, but uh, Teresa is a registered nurse uh, in, in Rhode Island. And uh, at, at a certain point uh, she was taking care of her grandmother who was in hospice care. And um, C. diff, unfortunately, is kind of rampant in medical facilities. She picked up a C. diff infection herself, and antibiotics weren't knocking it out. So she did round after round of antibiotics. And, and uh, you know, people who know about C. diff know that it's it's a devastating disease. You mm-hmm. eat, it comes right out of you, it's hard to work. It's hard to live. Um, so she was desperate. And uh, this was in the early days of fecal transplants, FMT. Uh, she was fortunate. She uh, uh, There was a, a very experienced gastroenterologist near her in Rhode Island who said, look, the only thing that the medical world can offer you now is FMT. And... Um, 
you know, the recommendation is to use a donor who is mm -hmm. in your family, is healthy. So Teresa picked her daughter and um, went ahead with the fecal transplant, which was an, an infusion uh, done done through the, the rectum. Immediate relief. She was cured. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And, and that's the experience of most people who use FMT for C. diff. Anyway, subsequently, she gained a lot of weight. Um, she went from being, I think, 122 pounds up to 180, 190 something. And she was just shocked because her diet hadn't changed. And she asked herself, well, what had changed? Well, she had uh, received her daughter's microbes and her daughter had a weight problem. Her daughter was um, uh, tending towards obesity. And so in, in, you know, it can't be proven, but in Teresa's mm -hmm. mind, uh, the, the microbes from her daughter predisposed her to weight gain. And uh, we don't know, maybe it was the combination of her gut microbes being so disrupted, so nuked by the, uh, all the antibiotics that she took for C. diff and then getting this infusion of microbes from her daughter. Um, anyway, uh, Teresa tried every everything to lose weight. You can imagine going from 122 up to 190 something. That's shocking mm. and, and really unhealthy. And she was starting to have other health problems. She heard about a clinical trial that was happening at a you know, one of the best hospitals in America. It's in Boston. It's called Massachusetts General Hospital. And the study uh, was designed to see if giving people who suffered from obesity, fecal transplants from lean, healthy donors would uh, change their, uh, you know, metabolic markers and would also lead to weight loss. So she enrolled in this study. And uh, if you, you need to see the film to find out what happened. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That, that would have spoiled the whole, the whole movie. <laughs> There was an interesting part of the movie as well where Dr. Dominguez Bello was looking at how you could potentially improve the microbiome of babies born via C-section. Yes. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yes. Well, the research shows that uh, babies who are born by C-section uh, generally are at greater risk for asthma, food allergies, obesity, and diabetes. And Gloria herself uh, was talked into having a C-section birth for uh, her daughter, Adriana. And um, you, you, you see in the film that Adriana um, suffers from allergies. Hmm. Um, so, of course, this, this question was in Gloria's head for a long time. And she decided to start doing uh, studies looking at the practice of swabbing C-section babies with their mother's vaginal, vaginal microbes. Mm. And that is an ongoing study. Um, I think there will be results in a year or two from it. And there are other, other studies happening simultaneously. There's a big one in Sweden. And the question is whether um, swabbing uh, a, a newborn C-section baby with their mom's microbes will uh, reduce the tendency to these diseases. What, what Gloria and others know from the research already is that uh, that there is a restoration through the swabbing yeah. uh, that, that happens. But the question is whether that is going to have an impact long term on health outcomes and whether yeah. it it uh, prevents these debilitating chronic diseases. So mm -hmm. the jury is out on that. Um, and so people just have to pay attention <laughs> to, to news about the microbiome over the next mm -hmm. year or two. But it's, uh, you know, it, it, it makes sense. Mm. Uh, this is the way uh, humanity has passed its microbiome from generation to generation yeah. for for hundreds and hundreds of years. So yeah. um, we we've disrupted that.
But C-sections are very important, just like antibiotics mm. are very important. They saved lives. Mm. Uh, the, the, you know, the medical research is that something like 15% of, of uh, C-sections are absolutely necessary. They are medically necessary mm. to save a mother and or a child's life. Mm. So the film is not suggesting that C-sections are bad where the Gloria in her work is is suggesting that if a, a C-section isn't medically necessary, it's not a good idea to do it. Mm. But unfortunately, C-sections have become a big part of the medical establishment. And uh, I, I'm sure they're very beneficial to hospital and hospital system income. Mm -hmm. And they're also more efficient uh, because you can plan a baby's mm. delivery, you're, you know, you may not be waiting a couple of days. So we, we see very high rates of C-sections in countries where there are also high rates of certain chronic diseases. China has mm. a 50% uh, C-section birth rate. Urban Brazil is 80%. In the U.S., it's 33%. I don't know what it is in the UK. You 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 might Probably know yourself. Probably similar to the US. Yeah, it's probably similar to the yeah. US. And uh, you know, this is part of the medical culture, right? So it's going to have to change over time, and change doesn't happen instantly. Mm. And I think the more the the studies prove the relationship uh, between C section birth and unhealthy outcomes for mm. C section babies the more likely it is that the medical establishment will not, uh, you know, will cut back on, on selling C-section births and the more women, uh, pregnant women will be knowledgeable and, and mm. won't be as disposed to go ahead with a medically unnecessary C-section. Yeah. I mean, C-sections and antibiotics in a way are kind of similar, aren't they? They're, a, they're absolutely necessary in certain situations. They're, pretty profitable and they're probably overused as well yes yes so uh you know marty's work has has focused very much on unnecessary use of of antibiotics and gloria has has focused on c-sections um and uh and also her work on the microbiota vault and um Anyway, you, you, I think you have further questions about the film. Yeah, I mean that that leads us on perfectly to my next question, actually. So, in the movie as well, you know, the question was asked: Do C sections and antibiotics lead to increased risks of autism? And there's a great story in the movie about a Chinese boy yes. with autism. Could you tell us a little bit about yes. the uh, story? Yes. Well, one of the reasons we wanted to film in China, have a story in China, is that they are using five times the amount of antibiotics that we use in the U.S., and I, I would think that possibly that's even greater than in the U.K. Hmm. Uh, and autism has been on the rise there, as have the other uh, diseases, um, although, you know, some people uh, in, the, in the autism community don't like to look at autism as a disease, as a chronic disease um, that is curable. But I'm 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 not going to get into that. We're we're mm. aware of that and, and sensitive to it. Mm. But uh, autism has been rising significantly in China, and through Marty and Gloria, we uh, found a doctor at uh, a hospital in Beijing um, named Yo Xin, who. Uh, had started a clinic to treat autism, autistic children, first trying diet, and then if diet wasn't successful, um, moving on to fecal transplants. Mm -hmm. And uh, her motivation for this, uh, you know, similar to uh, Marty and Glory in the film in part, is that she had experience with this personally. She had a son who was born uh, who was diagnosed uh, quite young with autism. And uh, uh, Dr. Yo had taken, been given antibiotics. Uh, she had a, a bronchial infection 
late in her pregnancy. And, and um, you know, she wondered if that antibiotic usage had affected her, her child, um, whose name is Tong Tong. Anyway, uh, it, one, of, uh, one of the children who came to uh, uh, Dr. Yeo for treatment is a nine-year-old boy um, with serious autism who he was diagnosed at, at the age of two. Um, he was given antibiotics. He, he, he was a C-section baby, and he was given antibiotics um, uh, at birth or, or shortly after birth because he was born with pneumonia. And uh, the doctor, uh, Dr. Yo had tried, um, uh, you know, diet, because a lot of autistic kids, I don't know what the exact percentage is, um, have digestive problems. They have mm. serious IBS. And this was, this was the case with Ning Ning. So first she, she tried diet to try to address that problem to see if that would have any effect on his cognitive skills and his behavior. And it didn't. And so she suggested fecal transplants. And her protocol at the time was to do one uh, poop transplant a month for six months. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the film, we follow Ning Ning's story um, from his first fecal transplant to what happens afterwards. And again, this is, <laughs> I don't want to give away yeah, uh, no. what, what happens, um, except to say that there is some, some benefit to him and that is not to say that fecal transplants are a uh, helpful treatment for all autistic children that is absolutely not proven there is a lot of research going on not only uh, by dr yo in china uh, there's a uh, a lot of work going on in the u.s at arizona arizona state university uh uh, Jim Adams and uh, Rosie Cram Jalnick Brown, I think, are the the principal researchers there. And you know, at ASU, Arizona State University, they're they're getting some positive results. Mm. But whether that applies, uh, you know, how much that applies to uh, uh, people or children on the spectrum, we don't know. And um, Autism is a complex disease, mm. but what uh, you know, what what Marty surmises in the film, and I think uh, Doctor Yo would agree, is that if you can help uh, diminish the symptoms, the 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 di you know the digestive symptoms, and anybody who's had chronic IBS can speak to this. It's really mm. disruptive. It really. Mm can make your life miserable. So if if you can uh, reduce those symptoms in a kid who's autistic, um, and we know there is this gut-brain access, mm -hmm. um, you know, that may help improve their their learning skills, their cognitive skills, their social skills. Their their life is easier. They're, they're not getting these pain signals running from the gut to the brain uh, all the time. Uh, so how does that help? Well, that's a whole other area of study. Mm. But here you go. Yeah. That's what the film is about, the early days of the mm. scientific revolution. There are more questions than answers, but it's really exciting. Are you a personal trainer, exercise professional, or medical professional who wants to upskill and take your knowledge to the next level? And would you like to take a class and be taught personally by me? I'm, of course, talking about Czech Integrative Movement Science Level 1 in Lancashire, England, on the 25th to the 29th of October 2023. I'll be teaching a clinically tested system that makes sense of the entire health and fitness journey, from anatomy to assessment to program design and coaching. You will learn 40 assessments, 60 conditioning exercises, and 27 program design principles. And the Czech framework brings them all together into an incredibly adaptable and effective system. From assessments to exercises to program design and coaching, this is a complete system. Students who master that system can create powerful programs 
that are tailored specifically to their individual clients' needs, abilities, and motivations. If you're serious about your work and want to take it to the next level, you can enroll on Czech Integrative Movement Science Level 1 with me in Lancashire in the north of England on the 25th to the 29th of October 2023. And you'll need to enroll by the end of June to complete the three fantastic prerequisite online classes, program design, scientific core conditioning, and scientific back training that will prepare you greatly for your IMS1 class. For more details, check out the link in the show notes. But don't delay, places are limited. I hope to see you there. Yeah, I, I have done a previous uh, episode with uh, an Australian lady who lives in the UK called Debbie Cotton, and she's taught me so much about the microbiome. And I called that episode uh, the gut microbiome, sorry, the human microbiome, the final frontier. <laughs> well, it, it is uh, it is kind of a, a final uh, frontier, but I'm sure science will discover another frontier that we, yeah, we, sure. we don't know about. You know, and a lot of this is technologically driven, you know, uh, without high speed um, RNA sequencing, it wouldn't be possible to really uh, look at the gut microbiome the way we are now. So, mm. you know, technology is, is, is driving to a large extent this research. Mm. And and new yeah. technologies may make new things possible, new discoveries. Mm. Yeah. One thing I, I, I learned from the movie I thought was quite interesting when it was stated that uh, in China they use what they call yellow dragon soup for <laughs> treat, treating diarrhea. I'd never heard of that before. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we, we didn't know either. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Yeo, who we also call Shin because that's her, her first name, uh, it, it, you know, in, in the interview, Shin brought this up. Okay, there's a tradition. There was an ancient tradition in China. We don't know exactly how far back it goes of, of using this yellow dragon soup, which included feces, to treat diarrhea. Mm. So there you go. FMT is not something new. Mm. It's something old, and and yeah. and that's not surprising. Yeah. So there's a fair bit of research going on into <laughs> into FMT. Um, what what kind of diseases is it already showing some kind of positive outlook in in terms of treating? Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, an expert in the field, but uh, beyond C diff. Um, there, there is some research showing it. I think it can be helpful for IBS, um, for IBD. You know, this this is not uh, conclusive yet. FMT has been used successfully in trials to optimize immunotherapy for melanoma. Um, I'm sure there there is more research going on. In, in other cancers. So improving the gut microbiome for certain cancer patients um, seems to improve the outcome of immunotherapy, which is, you know, just fascinating that our gut microbes mm -hmm. could uh, modulate the impact of, of um, a, a, you know, an oncological treatment. Um, you know, there's research going on for um, FMT with with depression, um, with uh, multiple sclerosis, MS, Parkinson's disease, uh, there there are probably other areas that I'm not even familiar with. Um, Marty Blazer likes to say that if you go to the U.S. website, the National Institutes of Health, and you look at their clinical studies section, and you enter in the keyword. FMT or fecal transplant, you'll see hundreds, hundreds of studies happening mm -hmm. all around the world um, looking at FMT. You know, one one area that's that's interesting to me is about restoration uh, using your own poop. It's called mm -hmm. autologous FMT, and one of the reasons that's personally interesting to me is that um, you know when when I've had to take antibiotics. In recent years, and I, I had to do this um, around surgery about six years ago, 
my symptoms, uh, my gut system symptoms and my food intolerances got much worse because I got mm. bombed with antibiotics. Mm. And I wish at that time that I had had uh, saved a poop sample and could have you know frozen it mm. and then reinfused it back into myself because I could have restored my mm. own gut microbes back to the baseline that I had before surgery. And uh, it's interesting, two of the, the scientists in our film, um, Iran Elinov and Iran S uh, Segal, who are at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel, have shown that autologous FMT is the most successful treatment for restoring gut microbes after antibiotic mm. treatment. Mm. Um, but it's not commercially available. There's no mm. poop bank that you can go to where you give them a sample, they freeze it, and then after your surgery or you know, God forbid you have something uh, that requires extended use of antibiotics, like Lyme disease is a big problem in the U.S. Um, people take antibiotics sometimes for months. Yeah, well, okay. You can, if, if you haven't had a lot of antibiotics in your life already and you're starting from a pretty healthy uh, baseline, you, uh, you will restore. I mean, the gut microbiome tends to be pretty resilient. But people like me, and maybe it's the same case with you have this problem, which is that they've been their their gut microbes have been so whacked that you're not going to restore easily. Mm -hmm. you may get worse. And so the idea that you could either you know get a, a commercially viable FMT crapsule, as as they are sometimes <laughs> called, um, or just infuse yourself with your pre antibiotic poop, mm. that would be great. Um, you know, if you want me to, I'll speak, uh, briefly about my own experience with FMT. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, my, uh, what happened is that following a surgery in 2014, again, antibiotics were used. Um, my, my IBS got much worse and I was really, really miserable. And of course my, my doctor was saying, oh, it's probably SIBO. I don't know if SIBO is even a real thing. Take antibiotics, take Zyfaxin, uh, or Rifaximin, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah. that particular antibiotic that was very popular for many years. Uh, that can help temporarily, but it wasn't a fix. Anyway, through another doctor, I heard about an uh, MD who was doing FMT on a compassionate basis, not just for C. diff, but for people like me uh, with, with chronic debilitating digestive disorders. So I I made an appointment. I went through the whole process. I had a few uh, fecal transplants and sub subsequently some crapsules as well. And I did get much better. Um, it was it was temporary. The improvement only lasted maybe four to five months. And then I pretty much went back to where I had been. Uh one of the interesting things that happened during that period was that I completely lost my taste for any animal protein. Mm. And I, when I thought about it, I realized that the donor that I had used, who, who the doctor tried to match with me as well as possible, um, because he was gluten-free, he was dairy-free, well, he was a vegan. Mm. And so his microbes were talking to wow. me. His, you know, to whatever extent they colonized in my gut, somehow mm. in this mysterious thing that we're still learning about the gut brain access, my taste for animal protein had changed and I mm. had become more like my donor uh, because I had his microbes. That faded over time. Mm. Um and, you know, as I said earlier, the science of matching donor with recipient is is not developed yet. Marty Blazer makes this wonderful analogy about FMT. He says, well, if you needed a blood transfusion, you wouldn't take just anyone's blood, right? You would have to match your blood type. And yeah. it's probably true with FMT that there are factors that are are yet unknown that mm -hmm. would allow for a better match between donor and recipient. And we'll just have to see as time goes by and the research evolves 
whether whether that's possible. In the meantime, there are certain donors who are known as as super donors, super poopers, <laughs> <laughs> because because they have a higher rate of success with mm. recipients. Um, so I'm I'm you know I'm sure they're they're heavily in demand, and uh, you know there's probably a funny film to be made about that about <laughs> somebody who's a super donor who's being harassed by a whole legion of people with with IBS who want his poop. And, um, you know, there there's a, a funny moment at the beginning of our film. Um, I don't know how popular South Park is um, mm. in, in the UK, but the, yeah, yeah, very the popular. series. Um, we start our film with um, an excerpt from an episode where where the, uh, the South Park kids... Um, well, the the, the storyline from that episode is that they're trying to steal the poop of Tom Brady, the the most famous <laughs> athlete in America, you know, quarterback of uh, you know of of the century, uh, because you know FMT has become a thing among the mothers and 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 the people in the town. Everybody wants to get better. They want to be young again, and so maybe if the kids can get Tom Brady's poop. <laughs> you know. Anyway, it's it's a great episode. I encourage people to watch it, and I encourage people to watch our film. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Like when you said, you know, your your taste for animal protein disappeared when you got the FMT. You often hear that when people have organ transplants. <clears throat> so, you know, they might they might come round from surgery and they say, oh, "I want KFC." <laughs> You know, someone who's like really, you know, eats organic, all fresh food. I've got a strong cravings for KFC. And it turns out the donor would eat KFC every day. There you go. It's definitely something that we don't understand, right? Yeah. Well, these are these are the amazing mysteries that science uh, tries to unravel. And one of the mm -hmm. things we wanted to do in the film is to... Um, you know, shine a spotlight on scientists and the hard and heroic work that they do month after month, year after year to make these discoveries, to go beyond cor correlation to showing causation and then finding effective treatments. And we also wanted to show scientists, um, not just as people doing research, but we wanted to show them holistically as parents um, as, as a couple in the case of Marty and Gloria, you know, I think one mm. of the wonderful things about the invisible extinction is that there's a love story at the heart of it. It's not just a film of, uh, about scientific research. It's about the people who do this research, what drives them. Um, and, uh, you know, how in it's often personal, but you know, there, there's a deeper, uh, love is uh, not just love for their children, but a love for humanity. Mm. It's a big global public health problem that we're facing: the loss mm. or the uh, the dis destruction of the human microbiome, the gut microbiome. So that's what we're we're trying to put on the map, and that's what's driving Marty and Gloria and the other scientists in the film. Um, Iran Elanoff, Iran Segal, uh, Libby Homan, Elaine Yu, uh, Yoshin, Talal Shatila. These are the scientists who we focused on, on the, in the film. Um, you know, they're all out there on, on this mission um, mm. you know, to help people like you and me, Lee, but also yeah. the next generation and the generation after. And when, when I think about this, I think, you know, that's that's not only critical to reduce suffering, but we have a planet that's in crisis. We need humanity. We need human beings to be as healthy and resilient and strong as they can to face the climate catastrophe, to face all the, uh, you know, the pressures of uh, saving this planet. And to do that, you've got to be healthy. And so... Mm. In mind as well as body. Yes, right. And the connection between the gut microbiome and the mind, a mm -hmm. whole other area of, of research that is very exciting. And, you know, I, I think what a film 
like the invisible extinction can do for people is to just wake them up to to make them aware that there are steps that they can take right now uh, to help themselves and, and help their families, their kids, and then, um, you know, to, to stay in touch, to be on the lookout for research in this field that applies to them and can help them and, and their friends and and so forth. But the steps you can take right now, you, you can uh, be mindful about antibiotics because you have a sore throat don't assume you need antibiotics maybe if your your child has an ear infection you go to your pediatrician um don't assume immediately that you have to go to antibiotics maybe you can watch mm. and wait a few more days because a lot of ear infections do pass mm. and and so treating them aggressively may not be the best thing um you, you know in terms of the microbiome it's definitely not the best thing and, um, you know, don't have, a, if you're a pregnant woman approaching birth, don't automatically have a C-section un unless it's medically necessary. Um, you know, eat a healthy diet, which includes a lot of fiber. Gloria Dominguez Bayo in our film, um, you know, she often talks about how fiber is the single most important part of the diet, fermented food. There's a lot of research on that. You know, some people say, you know, you got to eat a lot of fermented food. Some people say, well, it's, it's probably helpful, but you know, we're the, the science is still not completely proven on that point, but a healthy diet probably with fermented foods, um, a lot of fiber, um, you know, you want to avoid processed foods. You want to be mindful about the use of chemicals. In your environment, whether it's in your personal care products or it's in your household cleaning products, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're just all these different vectors, all these different stressors on us. And the, the gut microbiome is not our only microbiome. We have an oral and a nasal microbiome. We have a skin microbiome. Yeah. We have a vaginal microbiome. We, you know... <laughs> <laughs> microbes okay. are us you know uh when when you start to think about how how you have as many or maybe more microbial cells than human cells mm. um you realize that you are part of uh, this microbial universe and i didn't grow up thinking that way i grew up thinking microbes were bad guys you got to kill them mm. Yeah, you want to tell the people at my gym that because they walk around with bottles of antibacterial spray, spraying down equipment before they get on it. They don't sweat on it, and then they get off and they spray it all down again. And oh gosh! Just... But but that's a you know during the pandemic that well that's still going on, right? But it, you know it's that... it's a double edged sword. You know initially mm. it was it was assumed that that was that was important, but there is one. Uh, there, there are some studies coming out of uh, the early days of the, the pandemic showing that um, there was an overuse of antibiotics initially mm. to treat COVID because th there were secondary infections and doctors didn't know what would work. And so, you know, the microbiome took another hit mm. uh, during COVID. And there is some research going on looking at whether uh, and to what extent uh, you know, gut microbes uh, are protective from uh, viral infections like COVID, mm -hmm. and maybe others. You know, one other one other area we get into in the film is the uh, the problem of antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is a, a, a subject that is very important to Marty Blazer. Um, he is has been the chair of a presidential, an American presidential advisory commission making recommendations for how we can deal with this crisis of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, antibiotics in our food, but more importantly, the uh, antibiotics that we are uh, prescribed by our, our doctors. And it's a scary thing. Um, your, your followers may be familiar with the fact that the World Health Organization has predicted uh, that by mid-century, we will have more deaths from antibiotic-resistant bacteria than from cancer. 
And, uh, you know, this is something that Marty talks about in the film is is his fear of a antibiotic winter when antibiotics no longer are mm. uh, they can stop these really uh, aggressive resistant bacterias. And there you, you viewers uh, of our film will see the story of one woman who almost died from resistant infections. And they're mm. really, really scary and awful because some of them are flesh eating and mm. they just destroy you so quickly. So we have to, uh, you know, globally, we have to come up with new antibiotics, you know, preferably narrow spectrum because the broad spectrum ones do so much damage. And um, and there's a lot of work going on in, in the phages, bacteriophages, um, you know, that are, are viruses that can also knock out uh, bacterial infections. Um, and that's an exciting field. So there's just so much going on. Mm. I mean, it's, it's also on that point important that people you know as much as possible don't eat animals that have been injected with antibiotics as well yes you know marty thinks that yes that that is important but it, it's less of a factor than the uh the antibiotics that that we take orally mm. um it, you know simply because you, you don't absorb as much through mm. food but thankfully yeah. Uh, in the EU, well, UK is no longer part of the EU, EU but um, we escaped. Right in the US, um, you know, the the use of antibiotics in animals uh, has now been banned, except for mm. disease. Whereas uh, previously, it uh, you know, antibiotics were used universally; they were used to fatten mm. up animals. Mm. Uh, there's a, a shocking moment in the film about that. Mm. where you see just how far back that goes. Okay, antibiotics mm. were wonder drugs uh, that have, have saved so many lives, but it was discovered pretty early on that they also, you give an antibiotics to animals, they grow faster. Mm. And so that was, uh, you know, a boon to the, uh, you know, the, the, the agricultural industry for industrial mm. farming of animals. More... Yeah. You know, more chicken, beef, et cetera, in our supermarkets at a lower price, faster, mm. cheaper, um, and and out of control. You know, fortunately, there are some controls on it now, but they're hard to enforce. Yeah. And those animals that are injected antibiotics are generally fatter. That's, prob that's one of the yeah. reasons why they're heavier. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And that's the whole correlation between antibiotic use and obesity. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, there, there are, are so many different theories about, um, obesity and weight gain, uh, you know, but the, the correlation between antibiotic use and, and, uh, obesity or, or overweight, uh, an overweight problem is pretty strong. And also with diabetes, you know, that's mm. a whole uh, that's one part of the film we haven't talked about, the the work by the Israeli scientists, uh, Segal and Elanoff, about um, how our microbiome, uh, you know, modulates, determines um, our, our response to uh, sugar, you know, and, and how mm. by eating according to your gut microbes, you can control um, sugar spikes and reverse prediabetes. And there's a lot of work going on with this around uh, diabetes is a full-blown disease. And that's really exciting, mm. you know, that you might be able to uh, treat di diabetes and prevent diabetes just by understanding what your diet should be based on your gut microbes. Mm. That's really interesting, isn't it? Awesome. Awesome. So, Stephen, before we wrap up, is there anything in particular you'd like to add? Well, I'd uh, like to tell people that uh, they can see the film it's available on demand um, in in the UK. It's available um, through Amazon and uh, iTunes and also Vimeo on demand. Same in the US and uh, in, in much of the world, it's either available on iTunes or Vimeo on demand. Uh, we, we know that a lot of people are watching the film. We're receiving a lot of very positive reviews and comments. 
And so we're we're happy that the film is out there and, and serving its purpose. Um, you can find out more about the film from our website, theinvisibleextinction.com. And we also have a very strong program of educational screenings going where schools and universities and, and community groups can uh, rent the film and do a, a screening. And we uh, sometimes we participate virtually uh, to do Q&A and the science, some of the scientists have participated or uh, universities bring in their own microbiologists or local scientists, whatever. But we found that the film is incredibly useful for raising awareness and, and starting a conversation about the microbiome. So uh, I, I, I see that we have gone a long time here. Yeah, that's fine. I just want to say I really highly recommend, you know, if you're if you're interested in my podcast, you'll certainly be interested in that film. It's um it's not just educational, but it's quite um uh what's the right word? Entertaining at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we so, we wanted it to be entertaining. Yeah. And, and thank you for saying that because it's fun it's fun to watch. You're it it's not a normal science film. Yeah, you definitely hit the nail on the head with uh, the entertainment and the science mixing together. It's, it was perfect. Okay. Well, Lee, thank you very much for inviting me on, onto your podcast. And, My pleasure. Um, Thanks uh, for coming on. Okay. And if, if people have questions, they can contact uh, me or uh, co-director Sarah Schenk through info at theinvisibleextinction.com. Great stuff. And do you have any social media accounts? Yes, we do. Of course, I'm. I'm sorry, I neglected to mention those. That's okay. Uh, they are at the Invisible Extinction, uh, Facebook and Instagram, and there's a, a, a slightly different one for Twitter. Um, but let, let's just leave it at sure. at the Invisible Extinction because if you find those, you'll also find our our, our Twitter. Great, awesome. So that's all from Stephen and me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review, and I'll see you next time.